Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? Hello, wrestlers and coaches. I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the Division I level in the NCAA, 15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that, to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below, and we can set up your first consultation today. I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice. So legends of gold and Terry pack are going to be the guests tonight on the barbarian hour brought to you by barbarian apparel at www.barbarianapparel.com. Go check out barbarianapparel.com coach pack coming to us from Beersford, South Dakota. Did I get that right? That's right, brother. How you doing, man? I'm good. Good to see you. How are things you going too. right now? Oh, it's going good, man. You know, we're uh, just uh, like everybody. We're still trying to fight through a small amount of the COVID, but not like uh, the rest of the country. South Dakota took a little different stance on it. But, uh, you know, we're getting by. So it's been good. When you look at how you guys, you innovated there with your newer, newest facility, which I haven't even seen yet. I haven't been out there since the new facility. It was volleyball courts last time I came out, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was like it was just that and a part of a parking lot. So you guys innovated, and during COVID, like the height of, well, I mean, we're at the height height of COVID ever, actually, right now. <laughs> but when we had no idea what was going on, you guys innovated and ran ran a couple events out there, didn't you? Yeah, we actually uh, ran that big Midwest Ironman which that year we ran during Fargo. So once they canceled Fargo, we put that in place and we had 27 teams, 27 high school teams. And we had uh, 16 middle school teams, 12 youth teams. And it was, uh, it was a great event. We had almost 60 teams here that week. What's the max in the new facility for Mads? 10 or eight? No, we can, we can, but right now we've got the internationals up with the borders when we pull those out, we can do high school regulation and we can do, we can do eight pretty comfortable. Okay. If we want to slide the bleachers kind of out, out, we can do about 15 to 16. If you just wanted to go full, no like, like a field house mode, right? Like just a yes. field house yeah. camp mode, you could go 15 mats in there. Yeah, we could go 15 if we go wall to wall because we're 180 by 160. Oh my that's the building at legends of gold you guys i love because i got to see almost like the origin of it i was like one step removed from the actual origin when you were in your weight room where the sauna is right that was where the Correct. original wrestling room was in the old elementary lutheran school was that what it was yeah yep yep it was uh, it was, a, it was actually a boys and girls home that was owned from the lutheran church so your vision though like your vision of it well first thing first terry you know, you're the head coach, you're the director, you're the, I mean, we could give you every head honcho title that there is of Legends of Gold. It is your brainchild. You started it. Yeah. Correct? That's correct. Yeah. When did you Let guys? Going on 11 years now. 11 years. Okay. Was Legends of Gold out in California? Because you came from California. Actually, where were you in California that you came from? Yeah, so I was in Quincy at Feather River College up there. So it's about 45 minutes straight west of Reno, Lake Tahoe. Uh, and we did have Legends of Gold there. We started Legends of Gold actually um, back in 1998, 99 um, in Kansas at Neosho County when I was coaching there. Okay, so you actually were the head coach at Neosho with one of the greatest college teams, JUCO teams I've ever seen put together. I mean, you had a really good JUCO team. And how many titles did you guys win at Neosho? You won one for sure. I know that. Yep, yeah, yeah, one, one there. Yep. And then we, we finished in the top six, seven times. 
the lowest that we had was my first year. You know, we were seventh. We missed a team trophy by half a point. That was my first year as a brand new program. And then our second year as a program, we won a national title. That's amazing. And then were you any other JUCOs? No, I was at Iowa Central. And obviously they have a rich tradition. Uh, so I coached there with Ostrander and Bennett and, uh, you know, Troy's still there along with Luke Moffitt. And uh, I've known those guys for, you know, 20 plus years. And, um, you know, we, you had really good. We had a really good program there. We just took that same thing when I became the head coach in Yosho. So you took those models and, and I, what people don't realize about JUCO, I, JUCO needs to get more coverage, more media coverage, right? I know that Flow Wrestling actually did the JUCO finals at least once, if not twice. But there are some absolute freaks in JUCO, right? Just off the top of my head, TJ Williams, JUCO guy. Yep. Cormier, JUCO guy. Yep. Right? Uh, Lesnar, JUCO Davis. guy. Huh? Tony Davis. Tony Davis. Lesnar, I mean, the, the biggest freak, one of the biggest yeah, freaks Ron ever. The, the list goes on and on and it's on. crazy. I, mean, I think junior college has changed now to what it was. You know, I, I know when I was coaching Juco, and obviously everybody says that, right? When I did this, it was it was tougher back then. Uh, you know, I remember Juco back then where it seemed like every single person was leaving out and going to Division One when they were done. Uh, and, and obviously Iowa Central and some of those powerhouse uh, – JUCOs are still doing that, but, you know, I want to say 15, 20 years ago, man, that, that those JUCO systems were some of the best in the country, and it was nothing to, to walk into my wrestling room and, and see Mark Manning and Mark Cody and, and Brad Penrith and all these guys in and out of my room, uh, Bono, all these guys in my room all the time recruiting our kids, and um, I think the complexities changed a little bit for some reason, um, and JUCO doesn't quite have the uh, – the same level of athlete maybe, or maybe they're just not getting the same coverage. Uh, but, you know, 20 years ago, there was no coverage like there is now. Uh, I think if people would, if we would have the same coverage back then that we do now, and they saw the TJ Williams and, and the Cormiers and all the guys that came out, um, that Juco would, would really put itself as a spot right behind Division One. Here's the wild thing about all of it. You were in the golden era. And like basically what you're trying to say, and I'm going to say it for you, you were in the golden era of junior college wrestling. There's no question about it. No question about it. We just named off the guys we just named off. We're missing some. We're missing a bunch. Uh Uh-oh, Cain Velasquez. Cain Velasquez beat your guy, a guy I grew up with, Dean Taylor from Delta, Ohio, in the finals. Oh, yeah, break it. Yeah, yeah, break it. But make me feel bad again, man. <laughs> How did he? Hey, Dino beat him earlier in the season, though, didn't he? They split. Right. Dino beat him at Colby at the Open. And uh, and then he lost in overtime. Uh, and here's the cool part, right? So it was the first time in Juco history that the match came all the way down to heavyweight. We were actually ahead by a point going into that heavyweight finals match. And Iowa Central had to beat us to get their first national title. And if we won, we won our second national title in a row. And Iowa Central, you know, Kane won that match and and beat Dean. We lost uh, that national title by two points. Was it overtime? I think it was overtime. Kane Velasquez beat Dino Taylor, Welder, Handyman, demo derby, sprint car racing guy, extraordinary. (laughs) He beat this blue collar, just tough, corn fed Northwest Ohio plane Billy in overtime. And and he beat him earlier in the year. And that's what it came down to for a national title between Iowa Central College and Neosha. That's what you're telling me. That's exactly what I'm telling you, yeah. You know, and Uh, and, and for, for me, what made that special is like, you know, when I was at Iowa Central, uh, Mark Ostrander was a big influence on me, um, and, and Troy and I are very good friends. Uh, I shouldn't say that out loud because, you know, Troy's kind of crazy. So, uh, <laughs> you know, Bennett and I were very good friends coming through, and so when I went to the Osho, I actually won a national title before Ostrander did, uh, and Troy did. 
and then that they had to beat us that following year to win theirs. And um, as bittersweet as it was, um, I wouldn't want to lose to any other people other than them. So here's what's wild about that too. You know, we're sitting here talking about all these freaks, all these, you know, Lesnar, Cain Velasquez. I mean, they literally fought for the heavyweight title. Velasquez beat Lesnar for the heavyweight title and the UFC. We're not even bringing up the biggest junior college freak ever in John Jones. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and, and the list goes on for a lot of those guys that are fighting, you know, uh, CB Dalloway. Uh, I mean, the, the list just goes on and on and on of Juco guys. And, and they were being pumped out of like really four programs at that time. Uh, and it was just an amazing group of kids that came out. Was it, what would you say? It was Iowa Central. Neo show North Idaho and like Labette. Did I get that right? Or no, no, Lassen, no, no Labette back then was they were Lassen. okay. Lassen was ridiculous. Lassen was good, man, because Lassen had uh, Stevie Williams and uh, you, you know, and they were trying to get Stevie, but they had TJ Stevie end up in Iowa Central. Uh, I mean, Lassen had just a group of hammers at that point that was so ridiculous. The world was trying to catch up to them, uh, you know, and. We, we, we were able to, but it was, uh, it was amazing what those four or five schools were pushing out. And you throw Colby in at that time because Colby had so many good athletes coming out as well. So you could read it. Northwest Wyoming was good. I would say those are probably your top five or six. And, you know, and then it, then it dropped down a little bit. Um, but that was really like a great group of uh, junior college wrestling back then. It's crazy because Oklahoma State does a really good job of, of getting those guys, right? Like Oklahoma State, come to, when it comes to mind to me, they do the best job, I think, of really taking JUCO guys and getting them to, you know, they already get, they're getting freaks. Mo Wall is a JUCO guy, wasn't he? Who's that? Mo Wall. Yes. JUCO guy. Cormier is JUCO guy. I mean, just right there, right? I mean, <laughs> they did pretty well with those guys, right? I mean, yeah. it, it's crazy to think about it. But what do you think the biggest thing, you know, I don't know if people know this about JUCO, but when you were doing it, it was wild, wild west, man. It was wild, wild west. It was, you could do very unconventional things to win. It was wild, wild west. The rules are completely different than any division one, two, or three, even NAIA for that matter. You know, and JUCO is only a two-year institution. You know, you can only leave with an associate's degree. People don't understand that about junior college community college for lack of a better term it's the same thing as, as juco juco is the abbreviation for junior college but like talk about like the wild wild west of it if you can i mean man it was it was crazy back then i mean uh there were rules but that there was like that, like the, the recruiting rules didn't really apply to juco right then right so like junior college coaches could literally stand on the edge of the mat just talk to kids, right? Where the D1 guys couldn't and the D2 guys couldn't. I mean, they're now junior college, for lack of better terms, has kind of cleaned up their act um, because I think people had a really bad – Juco got a really bad reputation for a while because as many guys as it was putting out, it was also losing, right? So you would always hear about, oh, junior college nationals, this guy broke a TV, this guy went to jail, this guy did that. Uh, so I think they got a really bad rap for a while, so they tried to clean it up. Uh, so I think, it's a, I think it's a different system now. Uh, the rules are, are, are a little more stringent and, and a little more applied than they were back then. I remember talking to Dean, you know, you had to do some creative things with facilities. I remember him talking about that. I remember hearing about like they lived in like they could live in dorms or they had like these double wides. I heard all that. How, how creative did you have to get with all that stuff? Well, I think the, the thing that really was different for me is I started a program from scratch, right? So not very many people in their lifetime get to do that. Uh, our first year, we had 78 athletes on our roster. How many? And, 78? And 78. 78. 78. It was amazing, dude. People, I mean, we had so many damn people, right? And, uh, but, you know, the, the idea was to let those guys that weren't varsity be able to hit all the open tournaments. And, and being in Kansas was easy, right? Because you had all these big terms, University of Missouri, Iowa, Iowa State, you had all these tournaments these guys could go to uh, back then. 
Um, so it kept, we kept a lot of guys on roster. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that the biggest thing was A, trying to figure out how to house them because they only had a small dorm the first year I was there. And we had such an influx of kids that they went, uh, I want to say they went to Texas and they bought oil, oil rig trailers. And they brought them in and they put them in like, like the Calvary, man. It was crazy. So like they put them in a big freaking circle. And uh, only people that lived in it were wrestlers. And so like I had 78 wrestlers living in these trailers and like a big fire pit in the middle and all this. Dude. It, it was crazy, dude. It, it was like literally uh, some of the craziest times of my entire life, my coaching career. Uh, you know, trying to keep a handle on that many dudes, and, and they were living in trailers, and it was crazy, right? It's not dorms where you can go in and control it. Uh, that was before cameras you could pull up on your phone. Oh, man, I, I, could, I could tell you days and days. That you okay, okay, hold on. I just want to get a perspective. I want to, I want to draw a picture. I want to paint a picture of this for people. You had 78 wrestlers in circle the wagon formation. In Neosho County, Kansas. Yeah, but hey, you, yeah, you can't make this shit up. I, I, I mean, <laughs> ask, ask Dino and those guys. It was it was some of the craziest times ever, man. Oh was, my god! And, uh, you know, and we had really good dudes. I mean, you know, uh, Patrick Williams went to Arizona State was there with us at that time, uh, and you know, Eric Brown that went to Northern Iowa, and and. Uh, John Hardy that went to Minnesota. We had so many D1 guys that, that were that were popping through. That were, I mean, think about this. We had five high school national champs on our starting lineup. And so, listen, effectively for those guys to transfer to D1, they had to get an associate's degree. Is that correct? Correct. That's so correct. that's like sixty credit hours, basically, right? Yeah. It's price between. 60. 60 and 70 credit hours would be my guess, right? And then, obviously, the whole deal is with degree progress the way it is in D1, they've got to go. All those got to transfer in order for them to have the correct degree progress in order to be an, to be eligible for Division One, Two, or Three, right? That's correct. Yes. So that's basically that was your rule. I think like there's one rule that was the the rule. That was it. That was like the thing you had to hit. Guys, you got to graduate, right? And they do all these Netflix JUCO shows, right? And they show all the wild, wild west of it. And I think they obviously play it up a little bit. But I think, you know, I mean, in football and basketball, it is still pretty wild west because not everybody has wrestling, right? Like, even the programs we mentioned, does Neosho even have a team anymore? Does uh, Lassen even have a team anymore? They don't even have teams anymore, do they? Well, Neosho still has a team. I mean, they – they, they definitely dropped down from what they were, uh, but they're still there. Uh, Lassen went back to the junior college in California and no longer on the national NJCAA, so you don't hear about Lassen at all anymore. So, le okay, so all those California junior colleges created their own state championship. That is their nationals, essentially, correct? Yes. Okay. So what was the one in Quincy? Did they have one in Quincy? Uh, they did, but they didn't have wrestling. Yeah. So, like, and that's my, I guess that's my whole point, right? Not all these colleges, not all these junior colleges have wrestling. All of them have pretty much football, basketball, at least men's basketball, right? Some of them football. Yes. Because, yeah, you know, those are big revenue sports. Those are the two big revenue sports in men's, men's, uh, men's athletics, right? So they want a feeder. Yeah. They want somewhere to be able to recruit people. But I don't know if you watch any of these Netflix shows, but it's like – it's crazy. And if you're saying what it was 20 years ago and wrestling in circle the wagon formation and trailers in Neosha County, Kansas, I can only imagine. Listen, we don't want to have to do a lot of editing here. Okay, so let's keep this thing PG 13 ish, you know? <laughs> you can get nuts. Yeah, you can tell me some things that I would have to go and I don't know, I'd have to hide underneath my desk from the trauma you would tell me. Oh, there, there's no doubt. I, 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 I mean, I was, I was a JUCO coach for 15 years at, at two of the top JUCOs in the country. And, uh, you know, and, and with junior college, uh, with all the great talent, also comes a lot of great problems. So that's uh, Okay, so that's the big thing with JUCO guys. There's usually – grades is obviously number one, usually their issue, right? 
then there's all these other myriad of social problems that come along with and the stigma of not every kid has social problems. It's not what I'm saying, but that's a lot of reason why you'll, if you have someone who's got all the gifts in the world and the grades, usually it's a social problem is why they have to go to a junior college. Would you agree with that? Yeah, hundred percent. I a hundred percent, you know, I, uh, when we recruited people, we kind of knew that there would be one of, one of three things, right? It would be academic trouble. It would be social trouble, personal, personal issues, or sometimes, you know, we got a lot of kids that actually had good grades, but we sold them a different dream. You know, we're like, Hey man, uh, you want to go D1, you know, and, and university of Minnesota, for example, is offering you a hundred dollars. Why do you want to, why do you want to go for a hundred bucks? You come here, we wrestle a D1 schedule. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to see Iowa, Iowa State, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Minnesota. You know, you're going to see those schools. You come here, go out, be one of those dudes, put yourself on the map and see what you're worth in two years. You know, so we really use a three-pronged attack uh, when we were going after kids. So here's my thing, right? You're, you got, you're building a young family as you become a head coach for the first time. You got two young kids, right? You have Cody Pack. And you have Sydney, right? Mm-hmm. You got, you know, your wife, Lisa. Oh, man. She's a junkyard dog. I like her. She's a workhorse. You know, the, oh, you yeah. did this, this is a family thing with the packs. You know, their family, your family's involved. And your daughter's around everything, man. When I was there, I remember yeah. she was like a teenager. She's probably 20 years old now. How old Sydney now? Yeah, 20. She's 20. Oh, my God. I feel so old. Anyhow, it's a family thing for you. You go from junior college ranks being a coach in, for 15 years. Then you make the move to California. Is, am I getting the, 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 uh, the chronolog- chronological order correct? Yeah, Is that you're, correct? You're, you're right. You're what correct. took you to California? Well, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of it was is Cody, Cody was getting to be in junior high. And I'd always promised Cody's I missed so much, right, being a college coach. I, I missed the first time he won Tulsa. I missed, I missed, I, I missed one of his – first state championships as a kid um, because I was coaching college and I always made them promise when you get a little older that I would uh, I would I would focus time on you instead of time on me and and that's what we did you know we we made that we made that move to California uh, with my former athletic director from the Osho and uh, it was was a great move for us it was a great uh, it was a great family move and it, and it was a better it was a better move for me in a relationship with my son. So you guys move out there and you take what do you take an administrative job at the junior college? Is that what happened? Yes, yeah. See, I, I took over the head of their college foundation, uh, so I was actually in charge of all their dorms, their fitness center, uh, and they had, all of their stuff was actually bought at that point from the college foundation. So they bought apartments to turn into dorms because they had no dorms at the college. So we actually instituted uh, basically the whole thing from scratch. So it was a lot of work, but it's the same athletic director I started in the OSHA with from scratch. So it was a great working relationship, and, um, and it worked out really well for us. So you, you've got a habit of – I mean, you're like a feel the dreams guy is what I'd like to say about Terry Pack. You've got these visions. You're a visionary. I, I mean that sincerely because I don't think very many people – when you drive out to Beersford, right, you get out there and you drive. First, I love it. Let's just get that out of the way. I'm a homer here. I'm a, maybe I'm a bad source, right, because I love it. Because I grew up in the country like that, pretty out there, not quite as out there as you guys are. But I, I, I just don't think a lot of people see an old Lutheran home, a whole Lutheran boys girls school. I don't think a lot of them see it and think, I'm going to build a Mecca of wrestling. I'm going to put 15 mats indoors here. I just don't think a lot of people see that in the middle of the cornfields of Beardford, South Dakota. So that's, I feel confident in saying you're a visionary and a hustler and a guy who figures things out. I feel very confident in going out there. And when you told me about the, the, the new facility, I was like, how is this guy going to do this? How is this guy going to do this? Right? Not doubting you, but just, just genuinely questioning, like, how is this guy going to do this? So one thing I've learned about Terry Pack is don't doubt him. <laughs> He's going to find a way. Right. And I just like love the property. And, you know, that's where, where I got the idea to move out of Kent, Ohio. And you and I've talked about this before. Right. Own land. Right. I didn't want to be in this little, this college town. It was a cool college. Town. It was a great place. 
we had our first son there, but I'm raising my kids out here. You know, we were shooting yesterday. A couple of my guys I teach with came out last night. We were sighting in rifles at a hundred yards last night in the back of my woods, right off my deck. It was awesome. Right. So I got that from you and I grew up like that, but like, I really, you really put me into overdrive when, when I got set up with you through Cliff Fretwell and he was like, you got to see this place. It's unbelievable. It's even more unbelievable. And I got to actually get out there, you know, it, it, one of these next, next summer or two, you know, cause I, I do. Love yeah, it. for sure. But, but just talk about the vision that you had and the skills, the special skills that you have of taking, you know, <laughs> for lack of a better term, taking uh, chicken shit and making chicken salad. Tell me about that. You know, uh, I guess I got some JUCO in me, right, man? I, I, I think uh, I think JUCO athletes are um, – they have to take a tougher route. Um, you know, they're under a lot of scrutiny. They have to learn how to adapt to things way quicker than – you know, it's like when you go to Oklahoma State University, right, they have all these resources for you. And, and JUCO, the resources are, are your coaches, right? So we had to take kids. We had to, we had to be our own student support services program. You know, we had to do study hall. We had to develop grade check sheets. We had to be. We had to do our own travel. We had to do our own budgets. We had to do everything. And uh, for me, coming out of the Marine Corps, doing that, that mentality just uh, really, really put me on a different level. Like where I, I didn't want to fail. And when I put my mind to something, I just worked as hard as I could uh, to 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 get to the to get to the final outcome. And I think that's what a lot of junior college guys do. And I think that's probably what I learned during that time. And uh, I, I loved it, man. I, uh, I think it gives me a different mentality to want to work and uh, never fail. And uh, I think that's really what's helped me here is uh, I don't want to fail. And I, I don't want to fail these kids. I don't want to fail this town. I don't want to fail this state. Uh, I don't want to fail wrestling. Um, so for me, it's, it takes on a higher level, I think, than, than maybe it does for some others. And I'm not taking away from what other people do or think in their program by, by any means, you know. Uh, I just know I started with, with not a lot. And, uh, you know, and this, this year we hosted four junior work. We, we hosted four world team camps. We hosted the cadet world team we, for freestyle and gecko, the senior world team senior national camp for Greco, and we did the cadet freestyle at Greco world team camps. And um, that was a dream of mine to, to be able to provide that. And, and now we are. Uh, so it's just been like, and when you get a, when you get a little bite, you know, you, get, you taste that little piece of blood and, and you're a shark and you want more. And that's where I was at, man. I just saw that this could be a cool place. Um, and I've, I've just kind of taken advantage of that. I've had great people around me, and all of that's been very helpful. So you now literally have – you had two-thirds of a mat, essentially, to begin with in the pit where the sauna and the, re, the weight room are now at Legends of Gold, right? It was Correct. not even a full mat quite, was it? No, it wasn't. So you essentially have almost 20 times the mat space now. Yeah, especially between both buildings. That's what I'm you saying. Know, our, you have that building. building. 120 by 60. You could have 18 mats down at one time. If you went wall to wall with no, like not worried about borders or anything else, just mat space, yeah. Okay, I'm saying the big building, 15, the original, built, the 10 building I go to, the, the, the fab building with three full mats, yeah. right? You could do 18 uh, mats. Yeah, we were right at four. Yeah, we were at four when it went wall to wall. So, <laughs> it's amazing if you build it they will come that is the big thing i always think about that this guy made a field of dreams this guy terry pack made a field of dreams of wrestling in the middle of the cornfields in beersford and the times i've been there there's been corn on those fields and that's not an exaggeration they probably rotate the crops but you guys get you get corn probably every third second or third year don't you every every other year yeah and, i love it no when you were out here Zen. If you remember, uh, you did an interview with Jordan Burroughs. Yeah. And Jordan Burroughs was talking about how he was trying to find the place. And he's like, man, I can't find it. It takes a left. And he's driving in between these cornfields. And he's like, dude, I think I'm lost. And then all of a sudden, boom, there it was. And, and, and the crazy part is, 
that was that was six years ago already, man. Yes. That was before all the other great things that have happened and that we built and upgraded. It's amazing. The cafeteria is amazing. The coaches lounge is amazing. The dorms are amazing. They're named after Olympic champions. All the Olympic gold medalists, all, all the United States Olympic gold medalists. I mean, okay, so so just real quick, we're going to talk. It's still called uh, International Development Academy, correct? That's correct, yep. We'll talk about that, but I just want to go even further back. How many years did you serve in the Marine Corps? Four years. Just Thank shy you for of four years I came back to college. Thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. What was your background in wrestling in high school? You, you're from the state of Iowa, correct? Yeah, I, I, I wrestled at a, at, a, at a town way smaller than uh, Beersford. Uh, you know, so I, I, I grew up in wrestling as a seventh grader. Uh, my mom and dad were divorced when I was young. So I didn't ever have the money or the opportunity to do some of the things I wanted to. Um, I finally got to go to the Iowa State wrestling camp one year with Harold Nichols and and with some of my friends, the first time I've ever been able to afford it. And then uh, <clears throat> obviously went and wrestled in the Marine Corps, came out of the Marine Corps, went back to Iowa Central, wrestled in Iowa Central, and then wrestled at Westmore University. Uh, finished at Westmore University and uh, started, got a head coaching job out of high school right away. And uh, two years later, I was coaching at Iowa Central. And four years after that, I was head coach in the Ocean. Okay, what was your best finish? Did you ever make the state tournament in Iowa? Yeah, yeah, I made four. But you made was, it four went, times? Went yeah, I went good, though. What was your they best played. finish? You yeah. never placed in four state tournaments? No. I did not know that. Wow, you were a junkyard dog. That you qualified as a freshman, which would have been unheard of in the mid-'80s. Yeah, no, I just didn't. I just, I just always had, like, that, that little thing around me that, kept me from being where I wanted to be. Do you think that's a big part of the drive even still today? Is that, does that drive you still even today? Yeah, I think so, man. I, I think that it makes me want to, uh, to share that vision with other people, man. you know, to, to give other people opportunity because I really feel like uh, I never had the financial means to do some of the things I wanted to. And I think that, you know, that's why we went to a nonprofit. Yeah. That's why we give out fifteen thousand dollars a year in scholarships because uh, I don't want anybody to ever feel like uh, they they they're not good enough or don't have the opportunity to do something. Yeah, it's amazing what you've built out there, Terry, and 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 we can sit here and talk about it, and I can do all the video, you know, uh, footage tours and all that stuff that we do on the side by side. You know, and all the stuff that we drive around and have fun and Jordan Oliver rolls four wheelers and all that. But I don't think people really get it until they get out there. Because yeah, Cliff, I, I, Cliff wouldn't shut up about it. Cliff's like, man, you got to go see this place. It's amazing. And then I got out there and I was like, he, Cliff was not exaggerating. And you've, you, have, you have over tripled the size of the, the map facility you had. It's, it's unbelievable. Right. Okay. Yeah, Brainchild I, International Development Academy. Now, now. I, I have to speak on this before you do, right? Because you tried to use a word that's off limits. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And the word, I'll say the word, I don't want you to get in any legal trouble here. You know, I mean, it's almost like it's a first amendment thing and we can say whatever we want, but the word Olympic, because you're trying to feed the Olympic dream and get guys on Olympic teams and Greco freestyle women's, whatever it may be. Right. right. And that was going to be the original brainchild that was going to be Olympic. Is that correct? That is correct. There's going to be the ODA instead of the IDA. But what happened was you ran into some legal hurdles with it. Apparently, anything Olympic is obviously monetized, and the IOC owns literally everything. Is that correct? That is 100% correct. And, and obviously, I didn't know that because I've seen people use the Olympic rings on so much stuff. I've watched people put together camps and call it the Olympic camp. And I watched all these things. And um, – and because we were being supported by USA Wrestling and USA Wrestling came on board with us to help uh, work hand in hand with the, with the IDA, uh, people saw it and it just, they, they, they caught it early. So it was like a huge ordeal. Um, we publicized it. Uh, we got a letter and we changed it in like an hour from ODA to IDA. And it was really 
it's, it's really a, a better sequence anyway. So IDA, uh, International Development Academy in Beersford, South Dakota. Obviously, you know, you're a guy with big visions. I say a visionary. There's no question about it. You know, people watching this who are like, ah, whatever. Terry Pat's not a visionary. He's a this, he's a that. You're absolutely a visionary because oh, not a lot of people <laughs> would board kids, board room and board them and educate them in the middle of Beersford, South Dakota and get kids from all over, right? All over. You've got kids from all over. You get from Nevada, get a Nebraska guy when we first started. I mean, you, you got, you had kids from all over, man. And um, talk about the brainchild that is the uh, International De uh, Development Academy. Well, you know, I remember sitting with you in that little office <clears throat> over there and I told you what I wanted to do. And you're like, dude, I don't know if that's going to work. I'm like, I, I remember having this conversation. I, it's probably in one of these videos it's, you have that's happening on the side of my computer here that you saved for me. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to do something that helped feed the dream after high school and after college wrestling, right? Because they're, the only way to do it at that point is, is to wrestle internationally or wrestle on the Olympic scene, make world teams. Um, so we wanted to help find a way to bridge that gap. And, you know, we thought that by working with USA Wrestling and, and Matt Lindlin and, uh, and the Greco program with Gary Mayhab and all those guys, that it would be something that we could help make an impact on very quickly. And, um, and we did, I mean, we've made a big impact on it. And, you know, now we've got world medalists. And at that point, you know, then we just Doki came and trained with us. Cody came and trained with us and Anthony Linares came and trained with us. And, and it, it, it turned out to be uh, even bigger than I thought it could have been. So you had an Olympian training there, and Jesse, Jesse Thoki had your son, Cody Pack. Linares was at Northern Michigan, right? That's correct. Yep. And then he came aboard, and you, know, you know, and you had your first crop of IDA kids. And, I mean, you got IDA kids in college. Um, you did recently lose uh, a member of your family from the IDA, correct? Yeah, we did. Um, uh, that was tough. It was actually one of our first ones. Um, he was your first he commitment was. ever. Yeah. Correct. Caden, Caden Moore from uh, Nebraska, is that correct? Yeah, from O'Neill, Nebraska. Um, and it was a tough one, man. It was, it was hard. Um, just because he made such a commitment of his life to come here. Um, so he was very, you know, it was, it was a special thing. I mean, think about this. He was a state runner up as a junior and lost. And, you know, and he couldn't win a state title. And he goes, hey, man. I really think that you could help me take the next step. And he came here and, you know, he third in Fargo. He'd never won a match at Fargo before. Uh, you know, and then he signed a college scholarship to, uh, to Northern University in Aberdeen and um, probably just one of the greatest young men I've ever been around. So it was, it was, a, it was a tough loss for everybody. I mean, what a great kid. What a nice kid. I, I look back at that interview the other day that I did with him when he was the first yeah. person. And I was like, man, you're really taking a risk. And it's like when you meet someone who's just so confident and they've got tunnel vision, you know, and he really, he believed, he believed. And, and where has it gone from since Caden Moore committed and you had Billy, uh, Billy Sullivan, is that correct? Yeah, Billy Sullivan, and you know he went to UCO, and uh, he's had he's had a great international run. You know he's a couple time medalist now, and then we had Joel Adams from Nebraska that came in, and uh, also you know also a couple time medalist now, world medalist. So um, it's it's went better than expected. What is the when you first started? It was single digits. Where are you at now as far as people who board? and people who either live in Beersford and come every day, where is the IDA, IDA at in terms of enrollment right now at uh, Legends of Gold? Yeah, so uh, last year with COVID, we had 42 kids living here. Oh, my God. Um, but you got to remember, all those Cali kids, all those Nevada kids, all those guys couldn't train. So we were the only place at that point visibly open in the United States. So, so they all came. You here. effectively, your enrollment swelled because of COVID, because they couldn't do anything in the, in the coastal states. They really couldn't do anything in California. They couldn't leave their house without a mask on. 
you guys that's right. never shut down really in South Dakota. That's correct, right? Yeah, we shut down for 17 days just to regroup. And uh, for about a month and a half, we did have to follow some different guidelines where we were only allowed 10 people in practice at a time. Uh, we only allowed 10 people in a dorm wing at a time. And then that, that suddenly grew quickly um, to where we were done within about six weeks. Wow. And you have three dorms there. Is it still just three? Yes. Yes. I love it. Just three. And what is your room yeah. capacity at, as far as campers? You could put four to a room, right? You normally don't. You normally now, put two to a room. Four and six in a few of the bigger rooms. Um, you know, we, we like if we went like to where we're full, full, um, we can do right close to 150. It's like a, the actual number is 148. <laughs> That's how many kids you can legally board there? Yeah. Can you feed them all? And, you, know, obviously you can still do more, right? You can put them in, you can stack beds three to a day. You, you, can, you got the dance studio. There. You got the dance studio too. Yes, but that's turned, in, that's turned into earnings now. I don't even know what that is. Tell me what that is. Okay, well, do you remember that place we used to frequent in town? Burt's. Called Burt's? Yes. Well, we decided we needed a counterpart. So we turned that into a very nice coach's clubhouse. So now we have Bert and Ernie. <laughs> you made a hero. <laughs> there's a bar and girl in Beersford named Bert's Garage. Now there's Ernie's on the camera. Bert and Ernie's, dude. Oh, thank you so much, Terry Peck. You are a madman. I love everything about it. We got 20 minutes left, and I don't. I, it's gonna fly, man! Oh my god! Uh, so we got Ernie's, <laughs> which is the social club on campus where the coaches and adults can go after session, right? Is that about a good way to describe it? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, so beyond that, you have even more ground to grow. What is the total acreage that you own in that whole facility right there where you are, where it's all encompassed? Yeah, we're right now we're thirty-seven point six acres. Yes, and you could grow, you could develop at least thirty of that, right? Uh, yeah, at least thirty of it. Yeah, because there's you got lagoons out back, you couldn't do anything with. Yeah, uh, but you know we we've added in now a uh, full-length soccer field, uh, kickball field. Uh, we put in. Uh, a, 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 fo a football field, a soccer field, and a kickball area. So, uh, and it's all back nestled in between the trees. It's really cool. So you, you don't have to like kick kids out of there that often, do you? No, we hardly ever. I mean, they know if they're coming out into the middle of Beersford, into the middle of the cornfield, and the, into the, the the field of dreams for the the sport of wrestling. You just got to know that you're there for one reason. You're there to, to learn how to win at wrestling, get an education, and move forward to the biggest, next biggest, best thing. I mean, they got to know that. If you don't know that about that place, you have lost your mind. <laughs> and you're, gonna, you're not going to be there yeah, very long because Terry Pack will bounce you. Yeah, and, you know, and, and our, our, our pattern of success has been great. And, um, but I, I contribute that to the people that, like you said, people that are coming here, um, already have an expectation of what's going to happen. Um, and when they come in with that expectation, it definitely makes it easier to, you know, to train them and work with them. Um, how long was Coach Nolan out there? Josh was with me three full years, right, right at three and a half. And he had his first son out there, I remember. Yeah, man, he's amazing. He's an amazing young coach. And you brought – he was Cody, one of Cody's best friends out of Quincy, California. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Yeah, so uh, Josh came out and, uh, you know, went to college at San Francisco State. We helped uh, Josh end up getting uh, a job um, to, to go to Northern University and coach there. Which is and where Caden ended up. The Caden ended up going to Northern, right? Yes. Yep. Caden was at Northern. But Josh was here during that time. Yeah. Obviously, that relationship. So, Josh Nolan is he now in Georgia? 
Yep, he's with Cliff. Yeah, he's, he's with Cliff in Georgia. Okay. So when you think about it, right, you brought this kid from California, from the Sierra Nevada mountains to the, the plains of South Dakota, right? That guy's had a coast to coast journey and he's a really good dude. I, I'm a big fan of Coach Nolan because he went back to Nevada then for a minute, didn't he? Yes. Yep. Yep. He did. And, you know, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's another kid. He just, he, he's a hard nosed kid that worked really hard and, um, he, he's just like a fabulous. He's a fabulous human being. He's a really good guy. Yeah, I'm a big fan. I like Josh Nolan. He's a good guy. Really good guy. Coach Contos, who's at Iowa Wesleyan, was with you guys for a year, I believe. Um, who are some yeah. others? Uh, was Boomer with you, Fetchko? Yep, Boomer was with me. Boomer's a good dude. Yep, and I then like Boomer him. coached with me in California as well. Okay. And then he coached at Dakota Wesleyan. And was with us helping too. So, so did I? Do we get everybody? No, Mike Minna. Four time Hawkeye All American. Yeah, Mike Minna. Oh, Coach Minna. Coach Minna. Okay. Yep. Minna yep. was Mena with, was with well. me twice. Yeah. Okay. So Minna on two different. You've had two different stints with Minna. Yep. And uh, and then of course Jesse was here helping U.S. Okay. Olympian. Uh, Shabaka Johns was here. They came from uh, West Point. Cody was here. Obviously, he went to Coach Division One. He's back with us right now. Co so Cody, um, Cody is back. Okay, does Cody have no, a? He's been house? helping us right now until he makes a different move later in the year that I can't really talk about. Yet. No, no, I don't want you to. That's okay. Um, so Cody is Cody living in Beersford or does he live on the compound? Yep. Yep, no, he's back. He's back in Beersford. Okay, so he has a house in Beersford. Uh, yeah, he's actually living on campus. So. Oh, okay. Any grandchildren yet? The Malone and Eric. What's, What's that? that? Any grandchildren? Uh, yeah. Along with Linares, Linares on campus too. Uh, Linares is on campus. Are there any grandchildren coming? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, not not, not now. Not 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 yet. Uh, not yet. It's well, on the I'm horizon. I'm sure they're coming. I think so. I think All right. so. And uh, I'm, I'm excited, man. I'm, I'm excited when it happens. Awesome. I love to hear it. Uh, so he was at NDSU, and now he's back with you guys. Cody Pack. Yeah, yeah he was there for two years. Loved it. Uh, great guys up there. Great staff. Um, and it just worked out perfectly for us because we've expanded out to take over uh, West Sioux Youth Club that I have Anthony doing. And then Cody and Lee Dominguez, our Gilroy kid. Um, those guys are helping take over uh, Worthington's uh, youth clubs. So it, it just worked out great. We have a lot of moving parts right now with some, uh, with some things that we're doing. So we really needed the extra help. Okay. Talk about that guy. Cody Pack has nine lives. Cody Pack has survived multiple near-death experiences, like emergency room, you don't know if he's going to make it type experiences. Is that correct? Uh, he's yeah, crazy stuff, crazy stuff. And, you know, I still remember you did that video on Flow, and I think I think that's what you called it. You called it the nine lives of Cody Pack. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. So, so what is the first – is the first one he got folded into the bleachers? Yeah. So when he was little uh, – How old was he? Playing. He was going into kindergarten, so five, six. He was five years. He's the same age as my son Ferdinand, five years old. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, so he was at, we were in Iowa Central, and they were playing ping pong. We were having a coaches meeting in the gym, and uh, he, like, climbed under to get this ping pong ball, and all these risers collapsed on it. Thousands of pounds of risers collapsed on it. Cut his thumb off, uh, like, completely shattered his fibia, tibia. It was, like, just, like, it was hanging there. It was crazy. Were you, how did you get it off of him? Uh, believe it or not, Mark Ostrander's little kid, you know, they talk about all this, like, crazy strength the kids. So, Mark's kid was, damn, he had been about the same age as Cody, maybe a year or two older, actually lifted it up so he could crawl out. And I'll tell you how heavy it was. It took at least 15 to 20 of my college guys to lift it up enough for us to reach under and grab his thumb because his thumb was cut in half and under the bleachers. Oh, my God. So the kid had, like, one of those, like, 
out of body experiences where people left cars up and stuff. That's what Ostrander's kid did. Yeah, dude, I, I, I know it sounds crazy, but that that's exactly how it was. That's exactly what that's exactly what happened. Oh my god. Well, okay. Then what was the second one that we talked about? Was he when he was like 15 or something? Oh, so that's when he was a junior in Quincy and he was wrestling and he kind of said he had a that his he kind of had an earache and he woke up in the morning and his uh, the right side of his face was paralyzed. So we took him to the doctor and they said, oh, I think it's just uh, Bell's palsy. So they said, yeah, dude, you can wrestle. So he goes, he goes to masters and obviously dominating everybody. And uh, he gets through the end of the day and he's like, man, he's like, I can't, I, I can't feel my hand. And I'm like, dude, you just tough enough, man. You're fine. Uh, and his whole right side of his face started getting number. So then he wrestled his last match of the day. Uh, and in the middle of the match, he literally his arm went limp. Finished pinning the kid, comes off the mat, collapses, and uh, they had they thought he had uh, spinal meningitis. They literally told us to start calling our family, get our family oh in. They did think he was going to make it. So they take him to an area hospital, um, and they're doing all these tests, man, and nobody figured out. It was crazy because uh, – Obviously, in Northern California, Cody is a, uh, was, a, was a very big name and a highly recruited kid. And um, the, the wealth of people, man, there was hundreds of wrestlers and parents that came out in front of the hospital. Um, still makes me teary eyed, man. They, uh, USA Wrestling uh, back then, Dan Fickle and those guys did like a big article on it. Um, but it ended up, we had a doctor that we called and said, Hey, I think I know what it is. Like, they brought doctors that from Sanford and UC Davis. And to try to figure it out, couldn't figure out what it was. And it happened to be an ear infection that had eaten through the bone and through this canal and dripped into a spinal cord. So they had to go in, peel his ear off, fix this, lift the bone, graft the bone so it was like hard again. And uh, they told him they didn't think he'd ever wrestle again. And you know, six months later, he's wrestling the California State Tournament again, ranked number two in the state. So, and then obviously, everybody knows his college career. He was uh, no four-time NCAA qualifier and the D1 win leader right now at, at uh, uh, South Dakota State until someone wait, beats that wait, record. And, he's got the most wins in D1 D1 history. Four, four no, four South Dakota State. Four thousand. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they so got the no D1 win. Okay. Yeah. They're most because yeah because they transitioned up from D two right. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Uh, so you know they used to be D one back in the day, but he was the first. He was the first wrestler in the modern Division one era to have a hundred wins. Oh wow, that's awesome! And then was he? He made the round of twelve in D one, didn't he? Yeah, twice. Oh, he was a round of twelve or twice. Listen, I don't think yeah. people get what the round of twelve and what the round of twelve people. Just how good the round of 12 guys are. I just don't yeah, think people I, get it. And I don't think the people that they, they understand guys who've lost in the round of 12 before. I just don't think they get it. I, I watched one of your guys, a Legends of Gold guy, Rouser. I think it was Jade Rouser beat George D. Camello in the round of 12 right. at Madison Square Garden. You know, George D. Camello the next year's an NCAA finalist, right? Like, I think uh, Reader had a blown out knee. Reader lost in the round right. of twelve with yeah. a blown out knee. Right? Reader's a freak, dude. Reader can beat most people on one wheel. Right. Yeah. And you know, it was, just, it was one of those things. And uh, he lost to the kid that was third two years in a row in the blood round. Oh, what are the freaking wow. chances? You know. Because he lost to Palacio, who's a three-time All-American. He lost to Rambuto, who is a three-time All-American. So those were his those were his two round of twelve losses. I think that when you look at those guys, those guys become really good coaches because they've got like a Terry Pack type chip on their shoulder, and you know they never got to where they feel like they deserved, they belonged, and they earned right. Yeah. And I think that those guys really give a lot back to the sport 
I think those guys are uh, oftentimes the, the, uh, some of the best coaches, right? Because, you know, in the sport of wrestling, right. we're stuck in this mold where we've got to hire all the Olympic champs. Right. Well, those aren't always the greatest coaches, right? A lot of your Terry Packs walking around out there and your, a lot of your Cody Packs walking around out there become your best coaches or your best minds in wrestling or, or visionaries, right? Yeah, you know, I I think some of the best coaches I've been around weren't always the, you know, the the, the best guys. I mean, obviously there's proof of the pudding that there, that it does work, right? John Smith, Tom Brands, uh, Hale Sanderson. So obviously some of those guys really trans over, transition over well. But you know, I think a lot of the, I think a lot of those guys that are really good coaches. Uh, also are dudes that, that, like you said, carry around a little chip on their shoulder. Okay. Tell me the next harebrained scheme of Terry Pax that I'm going to doubt that's going to come true. Tell me what it is. What's the next vision that you have, whether it's in Beersford, whether it's in wherever else you're going to have Legends of Gold at. What is the next vision moving forward for Terry Pack and Legends of Gold? I want to somehow – help fuel the, our Greco senior level program. And I'm working with, I'm working with a couple athletic directors across the country uh, on being able to help form um, college wrestling programs that would focus on Greco Roman wrestling training. So basically Greco RTCs at uh, a couple different colleges across the country that would be able to uh, help fuel, they would be able to come into college there, gain, gain scholarships, not wrestle collegiate, but wrestle Greco, still get college scholarships, and be able to train um, and be able to compete across the country at the senior level. And I've got two athletic directors that are very much on board with it. And uh, we're just trying to work through the final transitions of it over the next probably seven to eight months and hopefully try to make an announcement by January of next year this time. So effectively no more Northern Michigan type programs throughout the country, right? That is correct. That's exactly what it would do. But uh, the colleges we're working with are going to offer, uh, one of the colleges in particular would be able to offer skill training with it. So oh, nice. It nice. That's my new job, Terry. I'm actually um, working with kids to get into the workforce, into the skilled trades, and into, you know, because not college isn't for everybody. And I think that that's a great route that you're going that way now because not a lot of these guys, we have a lot of guys who go and do it but they're not college material. They're just tough, rough and tumble kids, but they're blue collar, right? Right. I like that. I like that a lot. Oh man, that's awesome. Good for yeah, you. Man. I so, love it. Uh, I'm, hoping, I'm, I'm hoping to continue to work with these athletic directors and um, <clears throat> if everything goes right, it would be something that would start uh, not, not this coming fall of 2022, but the following fall of 2023 in uh, two different colleges at two different levels. I love it. I love it. I could sit here and be like, how are you going to do that? But I already know <laughs> you got a plan. You don't just uh, go in there gunslinging without a plan. I know you're big on plans and understanding how you're going to fund things. Funding is obviously the biggest thing, you know, uh, limited resources, <laughs> the human conditions, and, you know, we got to fund things. And I think that, if I know anything about you, there's obviously a funding business end of it. Yeah, man. And I, and I think, uh, you know, I think that's gotta be the key to it, but I think more in particular is having uh, the ability to network my time here has made people really, uh, really value what I, what I do for the sport of wrestling. Um, and it's given me a little more, I, I don't know, for lack of a better term, I want to say validity in the, in the wrestling world to some of those college ADs. So I think it's an opportunity to really do some cool things. <coughs> Love it. Give me a quick summer camp pitch. Normally you do like an expert takedown camp. Normally you're, you're getting in on it and you've got some really good camps that you do. Give me a quick camp pitch and what can people expect at Legends of Gold camps in the summer? Well, I think you, I think the biggest thing that you're going to see is uh, we've really tried to lower back some of our numbers. 
I'm really, I think I'm, I've been going to these camps where there's 200 kids at a camp. I don't think people get anything out of it. So what we really have done is uh, scale back some of our larger, like, uh, like our seven and 10 day camps and limited the numbers to 60. So those kids get a hands-on approach. Uh, to wrestling, not just uh, not just a meat market, right? Where they where there's 300 people in the camp. I'm, and this is no kidding. I know exactly. You know exactly what camp I'm talking about when I say this. I'm not going to say it out loud. But I, I went to a camp recently where there's 300 kids, and this coach is standing in the middle, Olympic champ, and he's trying to talk. Oh, those kids can't hear a thing, see a thing, learn a thing when they're all the way in the back. Uh, so we wanted to make that a, a more special interpersonal uh, relationship with the coaches. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna put to, we're putting together the, the final touches on it right now, and it's basically gonna be what's called a submersion camp, where we submerge um, those guys into a certain athletic program. So let's say, and I'm gonna say for example because we've had all these guys on campus before, right? Uh, I'm going to say we bring in Nathan Tomasello. And what we would do is we'd say, okay, we're doing Nathan Tomasello uh, submersion camp, right? So here's what's going to happen. Nathan Tomasello is going to, he's going to eat breakfast with you. He's going to eat lunch with you. He's going to eat dinner with you. He's going to show you how he trains, how he lives, how he does this. And we're going to, we're going to completely submerse those kids into an environment that, into a training environment they've never seen that's hand in hand with this guy. So, you know, like let's say that we wanted to gear it towards a college. We could call it the uh, the Bison Experience, right? The, you could bring in the North Dakota State coaches and do it. You could call it the Jackrabbit Experience and bring in South Dakota State, the Cowboy Experience. Uh, and, and that's what I'm working on right now, man, I, is, is being able to funnel this down to give these kids a, a more of a training model. Uh, you know, I, I think what was cool with us is Jordan Burroughs, hey, you were here. Jordan Burroughs, uh, Kyle Snyder, all those guys when they're here, they eat lunch with our kids, man. They, they sit in the room. Jordan and Oliver sat in the room with kids coming in, signing autographs on their tennis shoes. I mean, uh, I think that's what's special about us. And uh, I think that's what we're going to hone in on because that is what makes us special. And we're just going to tighten that up a little more this year. So Daringer came in. Hey, I must mention, we're at our time. Do you got two or three minutes, a little bit of overtime? Yeah, man, I got about two minutes. But I got to jump on call at 810. Gotcha. Okay. So you've had Daringer out there. You've had Jordan Oliver out there. You've had Kyle Snyder out there. Jordan Burroughs out there. TJ Williams comes out. You've got all these just great people who come out. They love to work with kids. You know, Nathan Tomasello, they do the interpersonal work. Uh, Zane Rutherford comes out. I mean, yeah. it's been awesome. And I've been at all those except for Coach Williams, right? Um, what's right. the biggest thing you want a kid to take out of a Legends of Gold camp, Coach Pack? Um, I, I think I want people to to have a personal personal relationship that they can't get at, at a big camp on a university campus, right? I want to be able to come here, talk to other kids, talk to coaches, uh, and be able to develop some personal relationships that you just sometimes don't get on on a big campus with two or three hundred guys. And uh, for me, that's that's my goal is to have every kid come here and have a good experience and and leave here. Uh, you know, leave here thinking that they got something out of the camp, not just some moves. Love it, Coach. Love it. Yeah, so people can check you guys out. Give me some information how people can check you guys out at Legends of Gold. Yeah, man, I think the, the best way is is always through our social media. We do a big we, – we, our Facebook page is always up to date on the tournaments we're running and the things we're doing. Uh, so I, I would say that the Facebook page is probably always the best for us. Uh, and then yeah, the website's got the camps and stuff on it, but we do a large part of our promotion through our Facebook and Twitter pages. Got it. What is your, uh, your website? Yeah, it's just legendsofgold.net for the website and, uh, everything else. You just Google legends of gold and come right up. Love it. I love it, coach. Uh, big headliner this summer. Do you have that set yet? Do not. Uh, we're just finalizing some things because if we hit these submersion camps, obviously we have to offer smaller number. 
uh, cause we want a smaller number of kids. So we have to make sure that's going to work with coaches because we want to bring guys in for four or five days at a time rather than a day at a time. So we're still working through some of those. Uh, we are doing our first ever off campus satellite camp this year. Where's that? Um, at Southeast Community College in Beatrice, Nebraska. Okay. How far? And, How far is that from you? Uh, it's about three and a half hours from Oz, 30 minutes south of Lincoln. Okay. So that's going to be. But, uh, yeah, it'd be cool. Zoe, Zoe, Zoe El Raj is coming, the RTC coach, obviously, from uh, Oklahoma State. Dayton Fix will be there. Okay. Uh, Cody will be there. I'll be there. Anthony will be there. Um, it's going to be a really cool staff. Uh, brand new dorms that just got built. It's going to be a really cool thing uh, to bring wrestling to that campus. I love it, Coach. Well, we're going to try and get out there in the next summer or two, check out the new facilities. Terry Pack, thank you for coming on the Barbarian Hour. Check out Barbarian Apparel, barbarianapparel.com. Terry Pack, the man, the myth, the legend. Coach Pack, stick around for a quick uh, sign-off here. Thank you for the time. And uh, Coach Pack, check them out at Beersford, South Dakota at Legends of Gold.